Well, w welcome back for our next uh, session on the past, present, and future of college and university and academic libraries. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce uh, our moderator, uh, someone who has been instrumental to the organization of this conference, uh, serving on the program committee that helps select uh, not just the papers, but also the overall direction of, uh, of, of the conference and the idea to host these type of panels in the afternoon of thought leaders in these various different fields. Um, and that is Mary Lee Kennedy. Uh, Mary Lee uh, has had a distinguished and varied career um, looking at libraries from a number of different perspectives. She's been the chief library officer at the New York Public Library. She's been the senior associate professor, uh, provost at Harvard Libraries. And she's been in private industry serving as the director of the Knowledge Network Group at Microsoft. Currently, uh, she is the executive director of the Association of Research Libraries where she's trying to build, AR, build upon ARL's strengths as a leader and partner in the research and learning ecosystem as, as a catalyzer of the global opportunity and value through its suite of programs and initiatives and as a culture that embraces innovation, diversity, and inclusion. Mary Lee. Uh, good afternoon. I'm very honored today to be the moderator for a panel of um, amazing leaders in the world of academic and university libraries. And I would like to introduce them briefly. But before I start, I wanted to just reflect on what the theme of this panel is. Um, the panel is here to discuss the changing meaning of research library as a place, however we define that, in past, present, and future. It really builds and extends the conversation that we've just heard around the centrality of libraries as a place to spark curiosity and in which people can actually pursue that curiosity. It also built, you'll, I think you'll hear things that um, reflect on the um, value of research libraries in the context of the impact they have in the research and learning community. Um, it, and uh, reflect the kinds of connections that are taking place across all we do in terms, in, in, in terms of the connection um, across time, so past, present, and future, which is the theme of this conference, as well as connections across functions being part of, embedded in part of the uh, research and learning work across institutions, including relationships that include partnerships and collaborations um, in our communities uh, for collective action, including with public libraries. Always remembering that in today's very, very complex world, um, we really have to keep focused on our compass and not necessarily expect that there's one map for, that will work for all of us. So I'm very pleased today uh, to introduce the panels, and I'm going to do this briefly so that they have time to talk and you have time to ask your questions. So Joe Lucia is Dean of Libraries at Temple University. Prior to that, he served at the University Library at Villanova University for 11 years. And during his tenure there, he won the AR CRL Excellence Award in the university category. Uh, Joe is, does a lot of very interesting work, um, as well as being a talented musician. Um, among the many things he did, and one of the reasons I wanted to invite Joe today was because he's in the process of um, building a new library uh, for Temple University and having to reimagine what that will mean for his community. So. It, Although he does many things, this is one of the things I've asked him to focus on today. Uh, next to Joe is Geneva Henry, who is Dean of Libraries and Academic Innovation at George, George Washington University. In her position as the Dean of Libraries and Academic Innovation, Geneva Henry is responsible for planning, directing, and overseeing all operations of the GW Libraries, Academic Technologies, the University Teaching and Learning Center, and the Academic Commons, the Center for Undergraduate Fellowships and Research, and the online education programs at GW. A big job. And I think what's very interesting about what Geneva has done is she's actually been able to weave through those functions the interdependency, the interconnectedness, and to explain how that's so important to the mission of the research and learning institution. 
Welcome. Martha, who's next to Geneva, Martha Whitehead, is Vice Provost, Digital Planning, and University Librarian at Queen's University in Kingston, Canada. She is active in regional, national, and international initiatives to advance digital research infrastructure and scholarly communications. She has held many positions on uh, national and international organizations. And the reason I thought, I mean, I adore Martha, but one of the reasons that she's, that I thought she would be fantastic for us to have an engaged discussion with is that she let, she played a leadership role in the development of Portage, which is a research data management network that launched across the entire country of Canada. And I thought that would be an interesting perspective to bring to our conversation today. Mona McCormick, who's directly on my right, is Associate University Librarian for Scholarly Publishing, Research, and IT at the University of Delaware Library, Museums, and Press, where she directs programs in publishing and scholarly communication, including the University of Delaware Press. I think that's what's very interesting about the career that uh, Monica has had is that she's beginning to ex uh, really reflect this deep partnership between presses, publishing, and research libraries, and I thought it would be very interesting to hear about her role in that, and as we reflect on the past of libraries today, where we are and where we might be heading. So thank you for joining us. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Um, the context for today is going to be, I'm going to, we're going to talk about three questions. And each uh, individual here has expressed one of the questions that they feel uh, some, some passion, more passion than the other, although a lot of passion for all of them. <laughs> and uh, so they will, we'll spend about 10 minutes on each question and, and as a group, and then we're going to take this back to the audience for your questions. All right, so Martha, we're going to start with you. How has the research library's impact, impact stay the same or change from the past in the context of the university's mission, including its role in institutional and public policy? And given that, or in spite of that, whichever way you <laughs> prefer to respond, what is the desirable and achievable impact of the research library in the future? Okay, thank you. So I think I want to start by saying that I had some thoughts about this when I came to this event, but it's just been so rich, all of the discussion, that I think all of us here, our thinking has evolved as we've uh, spent some time on this. So I wanted to express that appreciation to all of the speakers who've come before, because yeah. it's been really, really interesting. And I think many of you touched on this idea of enduring values um, for, the, for the library. And so I, I'm afraid that some of what I'm going to say might have been said already, but I think I'm, I'm bringing a few new thoughts to it. So first of all, that notion of what is a library, and, and somebody on the last panel said, you know, we shouldn't say it's not about books. But I did want to start reflecting on that because we, we do often talk about the importance of our uh, physical collections or our, our collections in general. But if you look back at the iconic libraries of history, of course, they weren't built as though they were all about being a warehouse and about storing books. I mean, really, when you think of those soaring ceilings um, of the Library of Congress or um, the British Library, it has a feeling of being about contemplation and also about c public conversation, because often our spaces uh, build that kind of thing into it. And somebody also mentioned um, the Royal Library of Alexandria. And I think we often think of that as a symbol of loss of knowledge because we think of it burning and we think about the, the books and the scrolls disappearing. But one of the other interesting things about that library is that it was actually a model of a modern university campus. So yes, there was the collection, but it was also uh, all about the reading room and the meeting rooms and the lecture halls and the gardens. So it really was about that sense of learning and research and public conversation. So I think I wanted to start just by reflecting on that and saying that you know, for centuries, libraries have been centers of learning and scholarship, um, stewards of knowledge and symbols of uh, culture and civilization. And as one of my students says, you know, when they walk into the library, they just feel smarter. So I think that's an important element. <laughs> and then essentially at the, at the core of all this is the value of information. And we often talk about our values, and I don't think we often put the word information as a value, but I wanted to think a little bit about that, information itself as a value. 
And I wanted to think about the value of creating it, sharing it, and preserving it. So when you ask about the policies that we influence institutionally or nationally, um, that's what we're talking about. And I spend a lot of time in Canada as the chair of the policy committee for the Canadian Association of Research Libraries in Ottawa talking to people about these very things as well as at our Senate and elsewhere at the university. So first of all, um, so creating, that makes me think about copyright and intellectual property. And I thought it would be really fun to bring a real book into the room. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So this is a, a book called The Intellectual Properties of Learning uh, by John Walensky. And I wanted to, to mention it at the outset because it is that a whole idea that learning really is, is built on this idea of intellectual property. And he, he traces the evolution of reading, writing, and editing practices through from the medieval period to the Renaissance. And he talks about learning giving rise to this idea of intellectual property, but really importantly, not the idea of commercializing it. So it's, that's something else that's been added onto this over time. So in fact, he says that uh, you know, today's push for marketable intellectual property threatens the very nature of the quest for learning on which it rests. So when I spend a lot of my time thinking about intellectual property and copyright, that's why. It's because it's fundamental to how we share knowledge. And then the second part about uh, sharing, so open access. Um, I, it was interesting to hear the explanation of the APS motto this morning, you know, open to all. And I think that's what we're all striving for. So we have our research granting councils requiring that papers be put into open access venues. We have a requirement for data management plans now to make sure that our research data is available for reuse, for checking, for testing, to make sure that that is valid research and all within the bounds of understanding that there are privacy considerations as well, particularly uh, research ethics around um, human research. Um, so those are, I think that's sort of the fundamentals of what we're doing in libraries now, and it's still built on what we've always cared about, about access to information, about privacy, um, about how we manage that. So it was really interesting to hear the discussions about metadata and classification this morning. That's what's in this, and so the network that uh, Mary Lee mentioned this idea of a research data management network. The reason the library is there is because that's what we do. We, we think about how you're going to provide access. And we talked about government information this morning. It's all part of the same bundle of stuff. And then uh, preserving, when I think about what we do at the university in terms of retention policies and, uh, and also thinking about digital preservation, that's a whole other element of the policies that we're thinking about. And um, I wanted to say, too, a lot of the focus here has been about uh, special collections and archives. And for us, it's, it's thinking that it used to feel as though those were sort of on the edge of, of our research libraries. Now I'd say we're saying they're dead center because when we claim that our territory is about access and preservation and long-term access through that preservation, I think of the work that archives and special collections are doing with that. And so we're really saying that, that that's sort of front and, center, front and center to who we are. And then the other thing I wanted to add on to this is, is a value that I don't quite know how to express it, but I would just say it's, it's complicated. I think, I think that libraries live in this, in this world where we have to think about freedom of information, protection of privacy. We have to think about um, the right to be forgotten, all those things that are you know, high on our minds in this, in this digital world. And I think I like to think that libraries are, are comfortable places, but they're also about being uncomfortable. It's about thinking about things like the portraits on the wall, or for us in Canada, as we heard this morning, uh, just thinking about our truth and reconciliation um, process, and we're all talking about Sir John A. Macdonald, our first prime minister, who really implemented policies that were very, very, very harmful for our indigenous communities. So should we rename our buildings? Should we take down those statues? It's complicated. So I feel like libraries live in that realm, and it's an important um, policy realm for us to be living in. So. Um, you asked me about the future. Uh, so I just wanted to mention, in this, in this role of um, digital planning that I have, we've just been doing some community consultations um, at the university and, and more broadly. And one of the researchers said something that I really took to heart. He said, every time you say the word digital, say the word community. And I think that's something that we heard from several speakers earlier, that really um, we're all about people and ideas. That's what's driving us. Um, it's about taking the best advantage of technology and looking at it critically, um, that we're not designing our systems based on old paradigms, that we're, but that we're designing them with diversity and inclusion in mind. Um, 
I think maybe all of you remember the Google Arts and Culture app controversy last January about you could find yourself if you were a white male, but you couldn't find yourself if you were somebody else. Um, and I think basically, that sort of looking to that future, it's that um, it is that information, real information and not fake news uh, or censored selection of information that endures. And then something that I just picked up um, from the last panel and, you know, thinking about that value of information, I much preferred the, the idea that we're about facilitating joy. So I picked that up from the public library realm. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Anyone like to comment or add to that? I'll only say that she robbed my reference to the Library of Alexandria. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I'll come back to it. Though, okay. You great. asked me about space. All right. I'm sure we'll come back. There's so much richness in that. Uh, so, um, Geneva and Monica. Um, from the past to the present, what has stayed the same or changed regarding the type and nature of our relationships with the various parts of the research and learning ecosystem? locally, nationally, internationally. What does this mean for the roles and responsibilities of the university library? And why do you think it will stay the same or change in the future? We've agreed that I'm going to start, because um, it's such a small question. <laughs> <laughs> So my, my past before I became a librarian, the first half of my career was as the university press editor. And I've been thinking in the light of this question about the origins of, and of the connections between university presses and university libraries. So at the University of California Press, and I believe at many other of the, um, the land grant institutions, the presses began as their university's printing houses. They pr produced printed copies of the scholarship of the university. And the library collections also began as exchanges of those printed objects. So the presses, the printing shops, and the libraries were intimately connected. This is all in the 19th century, um, continuing until the presses sort of became more like, like commercial ventures, and, um, and they've continued to do that for many complicated reasons. But I like that sort of understanding of that, that <coughs> deep link right at the beginning, that this was all one organizing institution, the university, its press, its library, um, and then the connections between those as exchanges. Um, so I've also been thinking a lot about the framework that Lorcan Dempsey from OCLC Research has given us with the, the sort of the shift from the library's collection as an outside-in collection where the library gathers materials and centrally organizes them and makes them available to our community to being a facilitator, an, in, an inside out organization. Our collections and our services are helping our, our readers find and use, the, facilitate access to those collections. So those, those I think are, are really helpful ways of, of framing because I've been now as a publisher in the library for about 15 years, really thinking about how is it that libraries can continue to support the creation the curation, the discovery of both institutional and external resources. My own work has focused mostly, mo mostly on the creating the institutional resources and providing access to those as a form of library publishing. Um, so when we think about this in terms of relationships, in our relationship, the library's relationship with our university, we have to really focus on the strategic goals of our institution. And, in every place I've ever worked, and that's now been about five libraries, it's, you know, the university wants us to support research, build the reputation, amplify the reputation of our university, and publishing is certainly a good way to do that, partly because that drives in more research funding. That's, that's a key goal. But also to support student success. So for me, those two things, amplifying the research, supporting student success, are what our publishing activities have to do. And I really de define our publishing, publishing very broadly, um, perhaps more broadly than most people would. But I want us to be taking more responsibility for that kind of broad publishing to think about all the tools and services that help us and help our faculty and our students create, store, share. We provide access to, we describe, we preserve a huge range now of scholarly outputs. So many of us started library publishing with, with journals and some ebooks, um, papers of you know, research reports, the things that um, one of the earlier panelists talking about government 
government outputs was describing the difference between a publication and you know an, an object mm -hmm. in some vague way. We're now in the world of many, many, many digital objects, so data sets and code and 3D printed objects and multimodal forms of scholarship. And the library is at the center of helping people gather all that and provide access to it. So what kind of publishing can we, how should we be doing that more effectively? Um, we're also now in the realm of having to help our faculty teach their students how to make arguments with digital tools, sort of creating a digital fluency in addition to all the other kinds of fluencies. And this goes beyond any individual discipline. So helping students think computational, computationally and just, you know, make arguments in ways that are not merely textual or with images, but with data analysis, with visualizations, with various kinds of geospatial skills. We were, the library is very much engaged in, in helping students get that kind of facility um, because many of our, our faculty members don't yet have it all. Um, it might be in certain pockets in, you know, com computer science departments, but it's not usually yet in the English department. Um, so those, those relationships between, you know, with our, local, with our local campus also help us, I think, we have to think about how do we then make all that available to everybody. And so for me, the future is, and I, when I say everybody, I, I really try hard to think about everybody. And everybody isn't just who has access to the internet because there's vast swaths of the world that don't. But if they only have partial access or they have access through their phone some of the time, what can we do to make that really useful? It's an extraordinarily complicated task we're setting ourselves. So some of the goals I have are, are about in thinking about the future are, are really, and th this is, it turns out to be much harder than I would have thought, really helping us move from the, just recreating the analog on, in the digital. There's still an enormous number of people who I work with who really, you know, they wanna, they wanna copy something and put it on the web and then it's digital and then it's done. And that's useful but not sufficient. So I want us to really think about the network that we're putting things into and building our materials in a way that's really networked. So um, some of my colleagues in the audience I see here are working on um, projects that are called collections as data, thinking about mm -hmm. the collections we put up as forms of data that can be analyzed, used, computed upon. How do we think about that as libraries, I think is a really important um, challenge for us. I think we heard a lot this morning about um, how, how to think about access in a whole variety of ways. The, the term authentic access is one that's been resonating with me now for a few hours, and I, I don't know how I'm going to try to do that, but I'm really excited to think about how many colleagues I now see around me who are really thinking seriously about that and are giving us some really important models for how to do it. Um, the, other one, the other thing I think that's really crucial is that we stop we recognize that what we've created initially in library publishing and in a lot of what we, we produce is, is a kind of niche, small, specialized thing. We have a charismatic faculty member who comes in and says, I wanna make this amazing thing. And so we work with them to make this amazing thing. But, um, and this is where my, my editor background comes in. When I was an editor, I would get excited authors and I would say, yeah, that sounds great, but you can't have 200 color photos. You know, we'd, we knew <laughs> that as a publisher, we could rein them in. Librarians are very uncomfortable saying that. They don't wanna say no. They wanna say, yeah, we'll try. And then you build this thing that five years later, you're beating your head against the wall to keep it going. We don't, I don't want us to keep doing that. So I want us to think and systematically about how do we, how do we empower ourselves to say no, we can do it for, with you, but here's the framework. Here are some constraints that are actually gonna make this scalable, sustainable, preservable in the long term. So I am fortunately in the position of going down in a couple of weeks to the Triangle Scholarly Communications Institute. One of my colleagues, Nikki, is in the room with the tool to, to work with another, a group of folks, and thank you to Don Waters, who's also in the room, who's funding this from the Mellon Foundation. <laughs> um, we're gonna be creating what I've sort of begun to call a checklist. I want us to think about all the qualities and characteristics of good digital publishing 
and help people understand when you begin to build one of those crazy wild projects with one of your faculty members, what are all the elements you need to think about and what are some of the best ways to do things like ensure discovery and access and preservation? What formats do you need to use? What kinds of tools and systems should we be building so that we can move from one, you know, one tool one tool to the next five years from now, there's a lot of elements to good publishing. And in the, in the print world, we know what those are and we're comfortable putting those constraints on. In the digital world, I think it's far more complex, but I would like us to start building some of those constraints. So that's one of the future ways I'm hoping we can go. Okay, thank you so much, thank you. So Geneva, what would you like to contribute to this question? Um, I'd like to build on some of what um, Monica identified as far as our, our traditions with research libraries and our role in the academy as the research library. Um, just at the very foundation, when we think about uh, libraries in general, our role is the preservation of the human record. Um, and in research libraries, that is taken very seriously. Uh, and one of the things you mentioned, Monica, was, you know, at the end, thinking about now how do you begin to uh, grow that at scale in today's world of the digital um, and think about sustainability and resilience because when it was the print world, we did that really well. And so coming um, into sort of really it's still a new world um, where the format of information has led to a lot of new discoveries and is reshaping what our role is um, in the research library landscape. Um, we still have to, to keep that in mind. Uh, so even though uh, on our campuses we are um, still perceived as the place where we provide the resources to feed the research that goes on on the campus. I don't think anybody doubts that. Um, but things have changed. As we heard earlier uh, this morning about access, that used to mean, you know, preservation of the human record and supporting research meant closed stacks and we'll control who gets to have access to those. And you've got to be a really serious scholar um, to do that. That was the research library and on a, a university campus. If that wasn't you, you went to the undergraduate library. It was that other place that didn't have serious collections. Um, by and large, those have gone away. I know there are still a few around, but uh, for the most part, um, that has disappeared. So uh, we have become increasingly accessible and certainly as we move into a digital realm um, and we have ceded control over the management of that content, um, those are, are much more accessible uh, where they are available um, online and especially when they're openly available. Um, what we've seen also with this transition is we need more expertise uh, in these uh, complex areas, uh, in different areas of technology and dealing with data and dealing with um, different kinds of, of technologies, different skills, you know, how are we handling visualization, uh, how are we uh, helping people think geospatially uh, when they're walking around with, you know, geospatial technology on their phone every day that that's how they use to live their life. So um, to stay on top of research, that means we need to stay on top of the technologies to work with this kind of information. Um, so we're um, starting to see, because that requires an educational element, um, and as was mentioned, uh, it requires that we be able to um, provide that level of education to our faculty and to our students and to our staffs as well uh, so that uh, we can continue uh, to be people who know how to work with this human record that we're preserving um, because the human record has gotten really, really messy all of a sudden. Um, so we find ourselves in this role where it's not being taught by anybody else, but the demand is so pervasive um, throughout our campuses. So we are the place um, that can provide this and it's an imperative for us to come into this. Um, that brings us, you know, all of this brings us more into a community on our campuses and our students are no longer the, the 
um, people who walk in to be quiet and study, they are um, also our research community that we used to keep separated. Um, so we've seen a real blending um, with the community. We've also seen a blending of um, what our mission is as a university, a research university. Um, we do two things at George Washington University as far as our mission goes. We do research, we do education. Those used to be very separate um, and faculty felt very priv privileged to not have to teach. Um, there are still faculty who think they're privileged to not have to teach, but most of them have to teach. Uh, and now there, there are faculty who realize that this is a good thing. This is the dissemination part of their research. Um, this is the whole part about knowledge, you, you know, the knowledge discovery, the knowledge creation, and then putting that into a publication so that it can get out into the world. So those lines between research and education have suddenly blurred and you look at the library's role and how do we make sure that we blur with it. Um, so certainly at GW, what uh, we've been able to do, and this really was initially driven by uh, the provost trying to find efficiencies in his organization, um, we've been able to pull together those core academic support elements that help faculty learn how to teach. When they get their PhD, they, do not, they are not told how to teach, but they come in, they're handed a list of courses and told, go teach. Um, there is a science to teaching, a science of teaching and learning. So we've um, pulled people who know how to work with faculty, uh, in those uh, educational developers, into our organization. Education is no longer just face-to-face, -face, it's online as well. So how do we make sure that um, the online education they deliver is delivered with high quality and uh, with clearly defined objectives that can be measured so that students are learning what you want them to learn. So whether you're teaching in the classroom or online, that's what we want to work with them to do. And we're able to pull that in um, with the library because our librarians have also been sort of working in those piece parts throughout the campus anyway, and now they are engaged in a fuller cycle. How do we create the right physical environments when uh, you're in the classroom as a faculty member? Do you have the right technology to be able to teach what you're trying to teach? Can the chairs move around? Are the students not distracted by you know, paint peeling off the wall and um, rats running around and you know, electrical <laughs> circuits, it, plugs <laughs> falling out of the wall? Um, you know, you've got that problem if you're in an urban environment. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, taking care of that classroom environment is all a part of it too. Um, and then at that point where the students start to stumble, um, because we do not admit students to GW who cannot succeed, um, but they're going to trip and they need some help. So how do we provide that coaching and mentoring and do it with their peers? Um, because the students are more comfortable learning with their peers and that requires a tight working relationship with the faculty who can identify student coaches who will um, be really good tutors and mentors to their fellow students. And then as we keep going through that academic life cycle again, you remember what our core was at the very beginning was research. So how do we um, identify those students when that spark ignites and they finally get passionate about something and start engaging them in undergraduate research, um, providing those fellowship opportunities, Rhodes, Fulbright, Truman, um, and getting them to go deeper because we do have a responsibility to continue to feed that academic life cycle and get them back into the academy if that's where their interests are so that they can be begin that process all over again um, and that we do continue to endure in that. So I do see that that's, that's where we are going. Certainly that's where we've gone at GW. Um, it's, it's not going back if for no other reason that, um, than that economics are driving that. Um, but with that, it's a recognition as was discussed earlier today, the skills that are needed um, aren't necessarily being taught in library school. A lot of these skills are not part of what our library schools are teaching. Um, and that's okay, but it's a recognition that we have got to partner throughout the academy with what needs to be done and also bringing in the right talent uh, to the library that sees themselves as a service organization because the entire university 
is a service organization. Um, we have a fairly new president who, this, this is the start of his second year. Um, first thing he said when he walked into the university is, the university is a service organization, which really runs counter to the way a lot of the um, faculty and professional staff think about themselves. Um, but it really is making sure we provide a, an environment of success for everything that we're trying to do. How do we all um, provide that scaffolding to help each other along? Um, so I do see that libraries are the ones who are pulling the academy together. Um, many of our libraries are centrally located on our campus. Um, and the great thing about that is it's not only a physical location, but it's a symbolic location as well. Um, in our complex environments, um, in our complex campuses, where our students go to ask questions, where faculty go to ask questions, they don't always know. We've, we've become very bureaucratic organizations in many cases and very compartmentalized. Um, so at GW, we've launched this semester this role of um, being a one-stop shop. We'll answer anything. You come in and you ask us anything. And uh, first day of classes, uh, I, I, I asked my librarians and staff to volunteer to work with our students um, that we call navigators uh, to, to answer the questions. You know, we were ready for anything. And it was pretty amazing um, what we got. First day of classes, I made the mistake of signing up for the afternoon shift. Um, <laughs> I had questions, you know, do you have A4 paper? It's like, uh, A4 paper? Uh, and mm -hmm. I, so asked around, I said, hold on, let me call the bookstore. So, and then I could tell them exactly where to go. Uh, visitors, can I print? I'm just a visitor. Y you know, things like you're not expecting. You expect the where's the bathroom, you know, can I get a study room? But the kinds of questions, it, they were all over the board. And um, what I quickly realized, you know, do you have tutoring, walk-in tutoring? Um, it's like, I can find that out. You know, they're ready to walk away because that's what they're expecting is to go someplace else and come, I'll come back later, I'll go someplace else. I wouldn't let them. Um, they were, you know, I felt bad. It was like I was holding a prison, prisoner. <laughs> so I said, no, wait, wait, I'm gonna get this answer. And then they were delighted because they weren't sent all over the campus. And I do see us, you know, filling that role. We really are um, sitting there at the center. We're also, you know, as, as Martha mentioned, with uh, policies, they're getting really complex, especially as we move into an international um, global environment um, where uh, we're running head in, headlong into uh, a lot of tensions between um, policies and practices and laws at an international level. Um, what we should be doing or not doing as a, a library um, and what we are compelled to do as a library. They don't always fit neatly together, um, and we're the ones that have to be there to work that out. Thank you, thank you so much. So in the interest of time, when the richness of the conversation and opportunity for the audience to engage with us, I'm going to move to Joe. And Joe, the, we, it's interesting because um, Geneva said the, the library is the place on campus where we go with the resources to feed the research. Right? That was a compelling statement. And so this question is really re related to both physical and digital space, including particularly access to collections. It has been a meaningful part of our users' experience in the past and in the present. What spatial experiences from the past remain meaningful today? including the space the university library occupies within a campus. And given what you believe is the future of the university library space, how do you plan for library space so as to be meaningful in the future? So this is an incredibly messy question. <laughs> um, partly, if you think about um, trying to, uh, in my immediate context, um, conceptualize a building mm -hmm. that addresses this incredibly dense, rich stew of activities, um, but also uh, continues to fulfill some of that iconic function, mm -hmm. right? Um, and also, in addition to that, um, should at least at some level 
be informed by the desires and needs of the local community. You know, uh, Siobhan used a, a term hyperlocality, right? And I think um, some of the some of the papers uh, and uh, other presentations were ad addressing dimensions of this need to focus on very very specific communities. Um, groups and so trying to, to understand what your community needs while also addressing um, this broader aspirational context for what a library is um, um, has largely informed the way we've been thinking about building and its function at Temple, this new building. Um, and you know, to, to go to the point that uh, Martha raised earlier, which is that you know. Um, in talking with architects, especially, uh, you know, th they think about um, the historical context of the typology of the building, right? So what has a library been historically? What's a library becoming? And how does that express itself um, in design? And, w and one of our touchstones, in fact, um, was this notion of, you know, if you go back uh, in the West, so we're talking about in our you know Western cultural tradition, what's a um, what's a library construct look like? And it's been a social space always. It's been um, a community-facing space, maybe even a small city. Uh, and one of the interesting dimensions of that, um, you know, there's a really wonderful little book that came out about maybe 15 years ago by um, a classicist named Lionel Casson. It's Libraries in the Ancient World, and it's a fairly deep although it's a brief book, look at how libraries um, were constructed as, um, you know, kind of design and social uh, environments. And one element of the earliest libraries was that adjacent across a courtyard to a library building was usually a temple of the muses, right? Mm -hmm. So this actually goes in the direction of thinking about the library as an inspirational space. Um, and uh, so the opportunity that um, we had in this particular context was to try and marry all those things, right? All these new functions, this, you know, what I think of as this diverse, messy ecosystem that the academic and research library is um, uh, as an enterprise of activity types and um, the way it's also, you know, a fundamental learning environment for our students. It's still the place they go to study. Um, but the reality is that they study in different ways now than they did even 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, you know, the, the move toward collaborative constructivist learning approaches, the, the, um, the in increasing prominence of, of a group-based learning and study groups so that, you know, inform uh, our thinking about what kind of spaces do we need to have in a building that serves that general purpose. Um, you know, an, another, I was thinking a lot about this earlier today, listening to some of the other talks, um, and I, I was looking, is that, no, it's the screen's not up there. So, one characteristic of a lot of libraries, think about the free library main branch here, um, is monumentality, right? Mm -hmm. And how does monumentality welcome or exclude? And you know, we wanted a building that has certain kind of monumental presence, but we also want it to have um, a welcoming presence, right? And we actually had a lot of conversations with the architects about what should that look like and what should that feel like, and what are the um, what are the governing metaphors uh, in your mind when you think about um, the library as a function, not just as a place. And, you know, so, and, and I'm, I'm saying this to set up potentially for some of you a year or two down the road, maybe a visit to see our building, if you haven't <laughs> seen images of it. Because we, t we talked about, you know, the library is a kind of gateway, a place you enter into the space of knowledge. Um, also, the library is a kind of forum, a place where ideas are exchanged. So, um, our building has this incredible big portico. It's the most uh, dramatic architectural feature of the building that sort of arches out over 13th Street. And it's, and it's got this curve, this two and a half story high curved glass, you know, kind of facade that is, you know, actually the, the lead um, designer on the project, Craig Dykers from Snohetta, 
talked about it as, at night at least, when it's lit from within, it looks like a cave. It looks like a big cave that calls you in for shelter mm -hmm. because behind this glass is this wood surface that's uplit, right? So you get this glowing warmth that's like a hearth. So you have this monumentality that's also welcoming, right? And, and, um, and, I, and that's very, very costly, right? And, and it, has not <laughs> been, it has not been without controversy, right? Because Temple is a, you know, a gritty urban public university, yeah. and this is a very, very um, powerful statement about aspiration that um, is expensive to realize. And is, it, is, it, is something like that you know, a worthy investment. And, and my answer, my argument has been, well, you know, our students are worth that investment and our students um, need to be inspired and engaged as much as any student. So this incredible function of this building to call you in and engage your imagination and make you feel smarter, right? It, this notion of a building that is, that announces itself as a special place, you know? And, and you know, uh, um, uh, Martha said this earlier, Libraries for a long time have done this. You know, I think about, um, you know, the British Library Reading Room is a great example. But, you know, the, the um, Suzalo Library at the University of Washington, which is this incredible, you know, kind of collegiate Gothic structure that spires up. And something that has been um, notable to me for a long time is that if you, if you go to secular institutions, um, often the most ecclesiastical architecture on the campus is in the library building. So if you reimagine it, that in a more 21st century um, secular context, what does that look like? You know, and, and you don't want to you don't want to invoke notions um, that are backward looking, but you still want to engage um, that space as a kind of um, you know calling out to your community to, to enter. So that's kind of the you know the big premise, and then. And then the, when you get down to thinking about the functional needs, you're, you're confronted with all of these disparate activities you need to do. Um, you want to deliver your special collections to a broader public. So for instance, in that case for us, our special collections are very visible on the first floor with an open um, exhibition space, maybe 30 feet from the main entrance, right? So. Um, you, you also want to um, provide the kind of quiet respite that a, a library can provide for study and individual work. So when you go up to our fourth floor, we have traditional browsing stacks mm -hmm. and a reading room. Um, you asked me about collections, and one of the challenges that we faced is that we couldn't construct a building large enough with the budget we had to house our collections in traditional stacks. So we decided that we would put about 90% of the physical material in a high density robotic storage system, mm -hmm. allowing us to have about 60% more floor space in the building for user facing activities. But we still wanted to retain that experience of being able to browse on open book stacks, right? So we will have a browsing collection up on the top floor, which we envision as being uh, the quiet floor um, for that tr traditional approach to the book. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, one of the, you also asked me a little bit about how does this work in you know, digital space as well as um, the built environment. And, and one of the questions we're asking ourselves and, 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 and working at is, so if you have only that per small 10% of your collection exposed for exploration, how do you then think about creating browsability and um, the opportunity to explore in the digital manifestation of those materials. And so one of the projects we're engaged in is building, basically re-architecting, while we're getting ready to open this, bu uh, this building, re-architecting and reconstructing our, reconstructing our online environment so it can do some of that work uh, um, by thinking about the collection differently and thinking about how to, you know, and, and even to take browsing beyond, I mean, you know, we talk, always talk about browsing and serendipity, but you know, that there were some really interesting critiques of, you know, taxonomy and classification systems. And, you know, in a, in a digital world, you are liberated from the fixed taxonomy of the call number, right? And you can start thinking about every possible way you could 
connect and expose things. And you and that comes down to what data do you have and how can you build on it, right? Yes. And what can we do creatively with that data? Um, and what can a user do to create her own taxonomies, mm -hmm. right? That might be different from the taxonomy we would apply to it. So um, part of our thinking, you know, is not just, you know, kind of architectural, but it's experiential and it's about what the online environment does as well as what um, the physical environment does. And then the other, the other piece is that we do have this emerging, you know, kind of digital era mission around new, new technologies, new techniques, new modes of inquiry, new modes of learning. Mm -hmm. So the building is designed to embrace those and provide ways of making them accessible to a broader community of users so that digital scholarship is not something that's happening behind closed doors with faculty and grad students, but is something that um, an undergraduate can happen into and be engaged with. And um, uh, so I'm sure I'm missing some elements. Another piece that I just, another piece <laughs> that's important is, that goes to Geneva's point, is that you have two what minutes. partnership, <laughs> right? So we have other people in the library, yeah. besides librarians, writing center, yeah. um, okay. learning support services, mm -hmm. so that there's that more integrated approach to what happens when a student okay. is learning. Well, you can tell this is a very rich conversation. <laughs> um, we probably have time for a, a question, two questions. Sorry. We're long-winded, aren't we? I mean, no. we're, we're all here, <laughs> we're all here for the questions. rest of the day, right? So <laughs> if you didn't get a chance to ask us all, you'll have a chance to ask somebody while they're here. Thanks. Uh, hi, Joe. Joe, uh, Jeff Kosakoff, Duke University, down here. Well, well. <laughs> um, what you described it sounded like a great, li a great library for any university like Temple. I wonder if you could talk about what's, what does Temple need that you're going to build in? What does Temple need that we're going to, oh, so that's, oh boy, that's a really, um, well, Temple st students need more and better study space because we have um, an undersupply of quality study space. Um, Temple as an institution is challenged to embrace its surrounding community and deal with um, providing a climate and a space of welcome for the residents of North Philadelphia. And um, one of my anxieties about this building is that it's so grand, maybe not in a monumental temple-like way, in the sense of a literal temple, but, but that it will not feel as welcoming to the community as our gritty 1968 era, you know, kind of uh, modernist concrete box. But I think one of our challenges is to figure out how to make that space a space that also speaks to and welcomes in the community. We have a lot of events. Um, we actually have a lot of community members that come to those events. We want them to feel like they can still walk into this building and believe they belong there. Um, in our current building, we provide access to public computing for a lot of residents in the surrounding neighborhoods who don't have technology uh, access in their personal lives. So I'm hoping that this building um, answers that need. Another thing we, we need to do is, you know, um, our collecting mission focuses largely on Philadelphia and the Urban Archive. This is a well-known uh, and continuously growing body of material that expresses the cultural, social, historical life of the city. And we need a better way to share that with the community so we have better facilities to do that now. There's other things, but those are things that occur to me right away. I, I know Martha wants a question, but I just want to check to see if there's anybody in the... I was just going to add to that answer. Oh, that's okay. Yes, please, yeah, go ahead. No, it just makes me think there was a term that we didn't use, any of us, and it's really important to me, is this idea of a global knowledge commons. Mm -hmm. And so really, you know, what we're doing at our own institutions is taking that local knowledge and, you know, helping the creation of it and the dissemination of it out to the world and the standards that Monica mentioned, you know, those used to be seen as barriers. Now I think people understand they're actually enablers. So that's always one of our most interesting questions is, you know, we want to be out there in the world. We want to bring the world so that the world is at the fingertips of our researchers. And what is it that you create locally for that? So I think it's an interesting question in, in this digital time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Um, I'm channeling a question from my boss, Bob Hauser. Um, 
who got called away and said, if nobody asks this question, I've deputized you to ask it. <laughs> um, so if it's a good question, it'll take some responsibility. If it's a bad question, completely disown it. <laughs> but, uh, but it actually gets at something that uh, Joe was talking about, and, but I would love to hear what the other people have to uh, respond to, and it's that concept of browsability which we did, was raised in the public libraries discussion, and the idea was browsability, that I think the comment was, is, is going up. It's increasing, not getting less. And when I hear, Joe, that, you know, 90% of the collection is now off, and there's this kind of museum-esque 10% artifact on the top floor to experience what a library once was, um, <laughs> I don't know if that's really browsability, because the concept behind browsability, at least as I experienced it and as Bob experienced it, and Bob's uh, critique actually comes from Madison and decisions they made there, um, is that you were able to, you know, you'd go to a, an area that you're conducting research in, maybe the, car, the online catalog didn't direct you to these other books, but you just kind of browse around and you start to find stuff. You're able to open up a book and figure out within a moment of time whether or not it is interesting or not, even if the title is. So I just wonder if you all could just respond to, because and I've seen university libraries, they're becoming the commons, they're becoming the study areas, they're becoming the teaching centers, they're becoming all these other things which are great. But the browsability is go, getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I just want to hear what you all have to say about how you think about that. Can I let my answer on behalf of my building first? I mean, so I will say this about the amount of browsable, browsable material. It's roughly the equivalent to the contents of a liberal arts college library. So 10% is so small, but it's, that's kind of how the number was arrived at. Um, it's not browsing a research collection. Um, and um, it's complicated. <laughs> um, I, I will, it, this is one of those areas I said, you know, we are continually, as you know, information evolves, um, butting up against these tensions. Browsability is one of those areas of tensions. Um, if you think about our information landscape now and, and what uh, researchers are looking, it's not just, you know, print publications, there's so much that's online and there's so much in um, non-traditional formats such as data sets, such as blogs. Research labs are now, you know, blogging their, um, their work as they go along. It's not the final publication that's mm -hmm. always the most interesting thing. So while in the past when there was a lot of print, the idea of browsability and also the notion that we did comprehensive collection yeah, that was, was a great feeling. It's a false feeling now. now. Uh, it, it's a, I mean, it might be a good feeling, but it's, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a lie. Deceptive, exactly, <laughs> to think that you really are browsing the knowledge um, that you need to be aware of. So that's, I think that's one of our grand challenges still, is with um, how we do visual search so that it's not overwhelming in terms of um, you know going into a search engine like Google and getting way too many hits out, uh, going to a librarian who has a specialized vocabulary who you know is you know even that's still secret, and they can find things that you can't find, and that that can help. Um, but we've got to get to that sweet spot of um, being able to discover information through serendipitous means of browsing. Um, and it's a yeah. tough <laughs> challenge right yeah. now. Visualization technologies feed into that. It's, yeah, okay. it's a challenge. I, I will be brief. I would just remind us that this morning we heard about a librarian breaking the Dewey rules to make things more discoverable. We need to, the systems we have put things on shelves in one place and not in another. Yeah. We need to think about how to, how to effectively break those rules, make, provide better digital access, better visual ways of finding things. But that browsing, there's a nostalgia for browsing that I think is a bit false. Mm -hmm. So Martha, do you have anything no, to No, you add? know what? I think we should go to another question because this has been well covered. <laughs> All right. I think we're done. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.